Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, and thank you everybody with uh, for attending this uh, presentation and the accelerator for hosting us. Um, let me share my screen with you. Let's see. Uh, do you see my screen here? It looks good. We're yep. um, we see the we see the presentation back. Okay. On. Yeah. Let me then put it in presentation mode. Okay. Here we go. Perfect. So uh, thank you again for hosting this. Uh, Puerto Madero project that uh, we have been involved uh, for uh, several years now. And uh, uh, I want to start with the uh, project team that we have. The architect is Torres de Malaga, SS Ace in Bogota, Colombia. Real estate investment firm is Consinfra LLC in Wilmington, Delaware. The developer is Torres de Malaga, as well as the uh, general contractor. They're a seasoned builder and developer in Colombia. The urban development was made by uh, Swam SAS in Bogota, Colombia. The CPHC is the E plus building in here in Montpelier, Vermont, USA. And the project feasibility study is being done by FIOS. So the project, uh, uh, 42 acres, 170,000 square meter site uh, located 4.5 miles. 7.2 kilometers uh, kilometers from the heart of Cartagena, Colombia's wall city, the one you see here there in the picture, one of UNESCO's World Heritage Site, has a zoning uh, density of up to 17,000 housing units in an integrated community. The, sorry. Uh, this picture shows you the proximity of the city the one mile uh, that you see here uh, of the uh, one uh, mile and 1.6 uh, kilometers uh, road uh, had to be uh, built. It uh, looks like in the middle of nowhere, but it's uh, right uh, in between Cartagena, uh, which is the major city in, in, in one of the major cities in Colombia and Turbaco, which is the capital of the state. So it's very close here and it's uh, bordering with the uh, Cartagena uh, 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 country clubs. So it's, uh, it's a very good location there. Uh, the area photo shows the proximity and uh, the we had to build also in this 1.6 uh, kilometers a uh, the uh, uh, supply of uh, water and uh, electricity. Uh, and the, we are building, we, we built also a, a water treatment plant uh, because there is no uh, municipal sewage available. So in few words, uh, the complete urban infrastructure had to be created. As everything Pasi Falls, it starts with the climate because as, uh, of its uh, ge geographical location over a tropical zone, and it's only 10 degrees uh, north. Uh, uh, and given that it is uh, crossed uh, from south to north by the mountain system of the Andes, Colombia has many climates according to its altitude which uh, are particularly constant throughout the year. This means that uh, the most important characteristic uh, when characterizing uh, regional climatology is according to its topo topography. This uh, linked uh, to other environmental factors create the six natural regions of the country and it makes 27 different microclimates, five in which humidity and rainfall intervene widely throughout its uh, 1,142,000 kilo square kilometers. The Amazonas and, and Orinoco basins uh, uh, built uh, a uh, hot, uh, in, in some spots, uh, uh, very hot uh, climate. The, uh, and the, the, the Andes uh, zone or the, uh, the uh, mountain zone uh, provides a great variety of climates from very hot to, to very cold. The East region is uh, the Pacific region provides a, a hot uh, climate and the Caribbean basin, it uh, provides a hot uh, or very hot and humid climate. And there is where our project is located. As uh, you can see, this is the climate. Uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, dew points of 76 uh, Fahrenheit or 24.5 centigrade throughout the, the, the year and throughout the month. And uh, so it's uh, what uh, the meteorologists here in Vermont would call oppressive. Cooling demand is permanent through all the year, as you can see here, and the heat losses are negative. So it's a totally inverse situation than what we have here in the northern hemisphere. The cooling conundrum that the world is facing uh, is uh, 
uh, implies that the global energy demand from air conditioners is expected to triple by 2050, re require new electricity capacity equivalent to the combined electricity capacity of the United States, the European Union, the J and Japan in 2018, and it will grow to 5.6 billion units by 2050, up to, uh, from 1.6 billion in 2018, which amounts to 10 new air conditioners sold every second for the next 30 years. And this is, comes from the uh, report, The Future of Cooling, made by the International Energy Agency. Therefore, the, the uh, reducing building loads uh, is uh, critical, and the passive house design can contribute to the greatly to this uh, and its readily available. The project uh, uh, was supposed to start with these three buildings here, multifamily, six story, 48 apartments, but then in, in, in 20, uh, 2020, but then uh, COVID hit and uh, we had uh, to, it delayed the whole thing. It, uh, and we are starting this year with this uh, uh, single family uh, uh, duplex uh, type of uh, houses called Guatemala's, Guacamayas project at 27 units. So it's uh, uh, the, this uh, shows you uh, the rendering of the 27 single families as well as the rendering of the three. Um, the, the development also includes uh, two uh, commercial buildings here as part of the uh, zoning and the part of the um, uh, permit, uh, the building permit that uh, the whole uh, development has. Uh, the, the floor plan is very sim simple. It's a ICF of 100 square meters, uh, 1,076 square feet. Second floor has uh, three bedrooms, two full bathrooms. The first floor has one bedroom and uh, one uh, uh, half bathroom, and then the kitchen and the living and, and, and dining room. The uh, laundry, we decided to put it outside the building uh, in order to be able to use uh, conventional laundry equipment and, and, and avoid any uh, possible penetrations that we had uh, to make uh, into the, into the uh, envelope. The standard uh, uh, common practice uh, in, is a post and beam and reinforced concrete structure. And uh, that presents, uh, as, as you can see here, and that presents uh, challenges for continuous insulation. So the common practice for interior walls uh, in Colombia is to use an EPS board with a metal grid to hold a stucco plaster and alleviate the overall structural loads in multi-story buildings. So we are using the same component to create a continuous exterior insulation wall with a 10 millimeters, uh, uh, sorry, a 10 centimeters four inches EPS, board uh, lined with a 2.5 uh, centimeters, one inch of stucco in both places. That uh, completely wraps the, uh, the uh, structural components as you can see here in this picture. We'll bring it all the way down to the uh, uh, slab insulation. And uh, this way we are uh, adhering to local practices and locally available materials, which is a very important thing. In this cross uh, uh, um, uh, section, you can see the continuity of the uh, of the insulation under the slab, all the way up the roof, uh, the walls. The wall is extended uh, so it can meet uh, the 30 centimeters, uh, 12 inches of uh, cellulose that we're going to be placing uh, in the, uh, on the ceiling. So the post and beam structures are wrapped uh, with uh, EPS board for continuous exterior insulation, as you can see here, so avoid any thermal bridges that you may have with the structure. The, this, uh, uh, next, uh, uh, this, uh, the, these uh, boards are covered then with a stucco 2.5 centimeters thick uh, stucco to make a complete uh, wall. Uh, this picture, uh, you can appreciate the raised insulation uh, of the walls in here to uh, accommodate the 30 centimeters, 12 inches of, uh, of cellulose. And uh, to support the cellulose, uh, a blanket of Intello Plus are gonna be, is gonna be laid uh, above this, uh, uh, these beams and taped with Pescona uh, Vana to the uh, wall to make it uh, airtight. 
the uh, here you can also appreciate the finished uh, wall uh, exterior wall of the uh, uh, Brazilian plaster. And every thousand miles the trip uh, starts with the first uh, step. Uh, so these are the first uh, four houses that uh, we're building. And uh, we are also building for uh, experimental purposes this uh, and commercial purposes this uh, three uh, uh, tiny houses uh, with the same principles um, of um, plastic house. For, uh, the uh, for the slab, we required uh, to put the uh, insulation under the slab because the temperature of the ground is 28 centigrade, 82 Fahrenheit. Uh, here, this uh, shows uh, how the uh, reinforced uh, concrete uh, slab is being poured uh, on the uh, EPS uh, insulation board. For wall to floor interior joints, we will be using uh, two components, non sac water based uh, sprayable polymer that builds a rubbery elastic uh, uh, membrane with excellent adhesion to the surface. This is something that's being used uh, regularly there in other construction uh, things. So we're just adapting to the existing method and existing um, available uh, materials. This uh, shows the two uh, uh, um, components. And one is water, the other one is the emulsion. They are spray uh, uh, at the same time along, and we're going to be spraying at them along the uh, junction of the walls to the floor and the junction of the walls to the ceiling. For windows, uh, the double pane windows uh, are enough uh, for the, that climate. The important thing is the low E glass uh, with a uh, solar heat gain coefficient of uh, 0 0.34, uh, which is the lowest one that you can get. Uh, this is a solar band, which is a very um, high class, uh, 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 I mean, glazing. Uh, uh, with uh, international uh, characteristics. The, we were very lucky to find a local manufacturer, local uh, owned company uh, in Colombia that has their own uh, glass manufacturing here in the United States. And so we, we, are, uh, we, we were able to source that uh, locally. The fix, uh, the uh, 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 windows are gonna be fixed in casement and with uh, insulated frames. Shading and dehumidification are the most uh, the main tools in hot and humid climates. Uh, we have uh, this is the Kufi model. We have modeled it, uh, for example, with a, a two uh, meters, uh, six point five foot uh, uh, pergola over the first floor uh, living and dining rooms, which are the largest one, and uh, and we are taking this uh, as uh, as the most uh, critical uh, one because this is exposed to the west here. So it's uh, receiving the most radiation from the West. It originally had a window here, a second window, this, uh, this room here, I eliminated it uh, to um, uh, reduce the, the uh, air solar gain. So by doing that, uh, we can reduce 3.24 kilowatt hours per square meter a year, or 1.03 kilo BTUs per square foot per year in cooling demand, saving 373 kilowatt hours per year or roughly $60 uh, per year. In terms of um, ventilation, uh, ventilation air is the main source of humidity. Therefore, it's necessary to minimize the ventilation volume to the 18 uh, CFM uh, uh, per occupant that uh, FIUS uh, uh, recommends or, or, or specifies. So four rooms equal five occupants equal 90 CFM ventilation air. The dew point of outdoor air is 24.5 centigrade, 76 Fahrenheit. So the water content of 90 CFM of outdoor air per day will provide uh, 187.46 pounds of water. Uh, so the desired dew point of ventilation supply air is 13 uh, uh, centigrade, 55 Fahrenheit. This is according to Lou Harriman, the, the humidity uh, uh, guru here in the United States. So the water content of 90 CFM of indoor air per day would be 90.26. So uh, the delta water then is 97.2 pounds per day equals 97.2 pints per day, one pint is equal to one pound. So at, at first glance, uh, the minute air with 112 uh, uh, pints per day seems okay. But uh, since these uh, conditions, uh, uh, this, this measurement is taking a different conditions, we uh, re-engineer this uh, and we calculate the dehumidification capacity required for these 97.2 pints. 
which came up to 5,994 BTUs per hour. Then we also went back and we generated the, the minotaur dehumidification capacity from this data uh, to 4,534 uh, 4, BTUs per hour. So there is a shortfall of dehumidification by a minotaur of 1,760 BTUs per hour. Originally, we had uh, designed the, the, the ventilation with a, a Ventacity ERV uh, coupled with a Fujitsu um, a DX coil for the humidification, but the integration of the two came to uh, to uh, too complicated, and also didn't uh, provide the uh, enough dehumidification, forcing us to have an additional dehumidifier inside, plus the uh, the an, uh, another. Uh, uh, Mini mini split uh, cooling only, so this uh, the, this shortfall will be remediated with a cooling only mini split that can take additional dehumidification and will be required anyway for sensible heat, uh, and also as well as by increasing the design dew point uh, to uh, of the ventilation supply air to 15.6 centigrade or 60 Fahrenheit, which is an adaptive mode that in my opinion will be tolerable by the local community, considering that the Outdoors, um, uh, dew points are 24.5 and 76. So we're going from, from, from 76 down to 60, so that should be okay. And one uh, 9,000 uh, 9, BTUs uh, mini split uh, will uh, have uh, the dehumidification capacity of 1.5 pounds per, per hour. So that's um, more or less uh, uh, for close to 40% of this, what you need. So that will take care of the this uh, shortfall as well as uh, any internal uh, heat loads uh, that, uh, uh, sorry, internal uh, latent loads that uh, we, we may have. Uh, this shows the ventilation uh, uh, ducts diagram. Uh, the, the trunks are uh, 20 centimeters or eight inches. Uh, uh, the branches are 15 centimeters diameter, six inches. And the, the, the eight, uh, eight uh, uh, inches, are spe uh, specified by by minotaur, so we're following their uh, guidelines, and the twigs are uh, 12.7 centimeters, five uh, inches diameter. The ducts uh, will be insulated with uh, four centimeters, 1.5 uh, of uh, fiber glass um, pad wrap, uh, so to prevent condensation. The minotaur will be located uh, here in the kitchen area, in in a, a, a cabinet. Uh, this is the best location we could find because otherwise we would have to put it here in this closet and killing the closet uh, would kill the, this bedroom. So, and this is the three dimensional uh, with the red, uh, uh, the striped uh, lines and the blues, uh, the supply lines to the rooms and the living and, and dining room. The for domestic hot water, solar hot water uh, roof mounting system is gonna be uh, used uh, they are come available in, from 100 liters, 26 gallon to 300 liters, 80 gallons, and provide water at 90 degrees centigrade, 194 Fahrenheit. So this, uh, there is really not the, 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 the domestic hot water uh, is not really a critical thing because nobody takes uh, hot showers in, in Cartagena, uh, but it's mainly used for uh, uh, dishwashing. Also, the tanks are on the outside, uh, on the exterior, so that prevents uh, any uh, internal uh, heat gains. And these are the uh, preliminary WUFI uh, results uh, that, that show the, the target um, of 171.92 kilowatts hour per square meter uh, per year, which are 54.5 kilo BTUs uh, per square uh, uh, foot per year. And uh, the uh, cooling load, the specific, it's going to be 8.08 8 watts per meter square meter and uh, or 2.56 BTUs per, per hour per square meter per, per square feet. So for a 1,076 square foot, uh, the total cooling load would be 2,755 BTUs per hour, which is smallest available non duct mini split of 9,000 BTUs per hour can handle well and provide the additional dehumidification shortfall for the minute. Uh, in-house testing, we're going to be doing it uh, in-house uh, because uh, there are no uh, uh, available services there. 
As a matter of fact, in Colombia, you can obtain a legal gold certification without having to perform a blower door testing. Those are the conditions. So we bought, the, we purchased a blower door uh, test system as well as a vein anemometer to, uh, to uh, balance the ventilation air. Um, in terms of the multifamily uh, project, uh, we, uh, this is not part of the, uh, of the FIUS uh, uh, feasibility study, but FIUS has been very, uh, very um, collaborative and, 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 and very generous in terms of collaboration. Uh, this was a collaboration we had with them, with FIUS in 2019. Uh, at that point, uh, we uh, compared uh, three uh, different scenarios, a baseline, which is the standard construction there, the FUSE 2018 scenario and the FUSE 2018 plus uh, net zero. So we compare envelope, thermal bridges, windows, air tightness, ventilation, and, and, and the standard construction ventilation is not natural. So they turn on the AC and they open the windows to cool the Caribbean. So dehumidification, cooking, uh, cooking is done by natural gas. So we're moving into electricity, uh, getting away from uh, fossil fuels and laundry. In that case, we're considering a condensing dryer because uh, every single apartment needs uh, their own um, uh, laundry room. We also uh, did an incremental cost analysis for net zero, uh, starting with the baseline and then adding the windows, uh, the mechanical ventilation, the wall insulation, the appliances, and we got a big credit uh, with the AC units because we're using much uh, smaller AC units and less complex than the standard uh, uh, multifamily construction would have. So we came up with a 5% incremental cost for the FIUS 2018 and a 9.7% incremental cost for the FIUS 2018 plus uh, PEs. The, in that case, the, uh, the the best uh, uh, option that we found uh, for ventilation was uh, doors uh, uh, centralized uh, uh, on the roof, uh, consisting of an ERV with a dehumidification coil, coil to supply cool and dehumidify air at 55 Fahrenheit or uh, 54.6 uh, wet ball. Each uh, apartment will have also its own cooling only ministry. But uh, depending on what the, the, we experience in the single family homes with the Minotair, we may change the doors for a, a decentralized ventilation with Minotair since this unit has been implemented already in many uh, large uh, multifamily projects here in the United States. We also did um, uh, six uh, cases comparison, improving the envelope to reduce the cooling demand uh, as well as the site energy. And uh, we found that the best cost effective was uh, we found was uh, 50 millimeters, five centimeters uh, of TPS, uh, same board that you saw before, and uh, medium solar heat gain uh, coefficient windows, as well as a high design, higher design temperature uh, for the adaptive case, uh, which could be this one. So at this point, I would like to uh, give the microphone to Andrew, who, who will let you know a little bit more about the. Uh, uh, policies and, uh, and commercial aspects of the project. Um, basically, I mean, the net zero uh, building pilot program will apply uh, a comprehensive approach uh, to improving energy efficiency, establish an overview of sustainable uh, sustain sustainability and decarbonization for the building sector, which doesn't exist in Colombia, accelerate policy, re policy reform for new construction, and plan for existing building, aim for rapid improvement in energy efficiency in new buildings, prioritize the use of renewable energy generated on site, and promote cooking, uh, electrification, and appliances efficiencies, which is another important point. It's uh, also we're considering grayway, uh, gray water reuse, uh, because we have our own uh, 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 water treatment plant. And also, uh, we have been considering rainwater harvesting to um, to supply the I mean the the water for the for the gardens and things like that. Uh, this um, uh, this was uh, Andrew's uh, 
the presentation here, so I'm not so sure what he was going to say here. So if he comes up, uh, maybe he can explain what uh, he wanted to say in terms of the right incentives that uh, we, uh, that uh, the, in Colombia you can have. And um, so the, oops, sorry. So the, in conclusion, the Puerto Madero pilot is uh, intended to be a fully thought uh, through mitigation pilot with activities based on real world context, which uh, could be implemented in the future. So we are uh, adhering to the, I mean, to common practices there and available materials. It's a totally different type of uh, construction than we have uh, here in the United States, uh, with uh, which is mainly with um, uh, wood, uh, but it's uh, very close to what uh, the Europeans are doing. And FIOS is collaborating with the feasibility study that could be uh, to see the, with, with the best adapted to the climate uh, specific and local building practices situation to provide various cost effective alternatives to reach the net zero goal. All right, Enrique, can you please put up the slide if we can? I can I can finish up this presentation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, everybody. I don't know exactly what happened here. It was working at the beginning of the of the meeting today. So. Right. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, I mean, our goal is to um, work on a pilot program for net zero energy buildings, uh, and we'll apply a comprehensive approach to improve en energy efficiency. So. One of them is really to establish the overview of sustainability and decarbonization of the building sector. Now, <clears throat> to do that, you know, transforming the building sector to a sustainable and decarbonized one means moving to net zero energy buildings. So in this respect, uh, an energy modeling process like the one that uh, FIOS with uh, Wufi Passive uh, can define a roadmap that is applicable to different climate zones, different climate regions. So the first step in our pr uh, perspective is to reduce energy waste by implementing obviously the path of our study. Now, the second thing we need to accelerate policy reforms for new construction um, and plan for existing buildings. Now, obviously new construction is a natural uh, starting point of the policy intervention in the field of building uh, of, of uh, buildings. Since these are uh, new infrastructures that do not create high levels of emissions or use energy. So the point is to minimize energy consumption to start with. In Colombia, there's regulatory instruments uh, such as the Sustainable Construction Guide, which was approved in 2015, which is a good first step, but it's only you know a small, small step in the right direction. Um, it's not enough towards a low energy footprint in the building uh, industry. Uh, the energy used by buildings is the sum of the energies used of several activities. So that's why a broad set of policies is necessary. Uh, this policy should cover first the improvement of energy efficiency in the design of the building, util utilizing the tools like the FIOS and Woofy Passive, and the reduction of energy consumption by the residents. Also, in uh, generation uh, generating renewable energy on site, and of course the sale of that surplus of energy. And then, of course, one of the important ones is the electrification of energy use. So policies in new buildings must be accompanied by policies that promote renewable of the stock of existing buildings. And it is also here necessary to build a roadmap that is actually based on actual models and specific incentives that are depending on the context. So at air, uh, aimed at, area, uh, at various um, actors such as owners, the tenants, the builders, or the renovation industry. So our aim is to rapidly improve the energy efficiency in buildings. And some of the specific policy regulations or recommendations that we're setting are to set absolute high performance goals instead of relative goals. So to mitigate performance-based approach like the passive house standards, uh, to make it mandatory for all buildings to improve the efficiency levels uh, over time. Now for that, we need to develop also a strict compliance regime and define and implement protocols to com comply uh, for compliance that are similar to FIOS Plus, Raiders, and Verifiers, demand peri periodic collection and information. And we need to address the capacity deficits that is clearly uh, in, in our market after that affect the compliance verification. We need to develop local capacity to implement and enforce and uh, the modification of new 
and stricter building codes. So we really need to work to make a profitable the go beyond the minimum. And for that also, we need to develop the quality labels that go beyond sustainable construction guide, which is what's, what's set up by the government. And we need to define stricter and voluntary goals and incentives for builders to opt for them. We really need to prioritize, prioritize the uh, use of energy generated on site. We need to promote the installation of solar heating and photovoltaic panels, which is what we're doing in our project. We need to facilitate the connection of the network and uh, net metering. That's something that we're working on. We need to formulate policies that ensure that the roofs of new buildings are prepared for use uh, for solar energy. And we need to promote the electrification and appliance efficiencies. Uh, we need to establish minimum energy uh, performance standards for appliances and discontinue inefficient products. And we need to really test pilots like ours for gas, re gas replacements as energy for cooking and based on the experience, scale back that initiative. Um, I think Enrique went through the rainwater uh, use and the rainwater harvesting. We're definitely going to be implement those two uh, very much. In terms of the rainwater harvesting, uh, it's one way for us to reduce domestic water use by the harvesting the uh, rainwater. We are using uh, rain that is falling on the homes, on the landscape, or in, for a variety of purposes. And instead of making it basically becoming storm water or pollution, uh, rain uh, harvesting the rain can reduce our need for the treated water, which is really important because obviously we have a treatment uh, system on site for the water transportation, reduces energy, and the energy that requires that uh, water into uh, into the buildings are going to be saved as well. Um, in terms of the last part, which is next uh, page, Enrique, is having the right incentives. Uh, scale existing financial incentives and explore the use of non-financial incentives in order to increase adoption. Um, through the use of different interest rates, in this case, uh, through the efficiency standards, tax deductions, simplification of permit procedure for highly efficient buildings, and others like donations and awards. In this particular example, this is one of the major uh, financial institutions in Colombia. They offer a 1% reduction on loans for builders and 1% reduction on mortgage rates for buyers of what they're calling green homes, which are not even close to past house standards but at least they're going in the right direction, moving towards uh, sustainable uh, homes or green homes, as they call it. Uh, our goal is that the passive house standard will become in the future, in the hot and humid climate zone that we're working on, the standard for real uh, you know, financial incentives in, in the market. So I thank you very much. I mean, I really appreciate the time that you've given us. We really wanna thank again, Pios for the collaboration that uh, worked with us. Passive House Accelerated for having us and, uh, you know, inviting us to present our project. And of course, the most important thing, I really want to thank the whole Passive House community. I think one of the things that I value the most, even though I don't join these uh, events that often, uh, is really the uh, camaraderie and the, the shared, uh, you know, great, uh, in incredible joy that we see in this group, sharing the experiences, the learnings, and, uh, and really just kind of the support that I can see uh, coming from all of you guys and really appreciate uh, the passive our community uh, overall. And, and, and we thank you very much for the opportunity to present our project. Basically, I mean, the, the, the board the, is a prefab. Uh, it's a very common uh, material used down there for internal walls. Uh, um, and I think in Spain that they do that too because they found a company in Spain that do, they do it. So it's basically, a, I mean, an EPS board with a screen uh, uh, complex, uh, uh, I mean, web uh, to be able to uh, accommodate uh, the, the plaster, uh, the 2.5 uh, uh, centimeters uh, plaster on the outside and the inside. And these are, are anchored here with, uh, with uh, anchors. That's what I was mentioning that we may have to consider this. Uh, as a, a point thermal bridge here. Uh, the, the, the boards uh, uh, need to be strapped also one to a, another uh, when they are joint. And, um, and so that's um, the plaster, basi uh, plaster ba basically uh, make them um, airtight uh, at the end uh, on, the, on, on these uh, joints. Does, uh, does that uh, uh, answer your question? Yes, it does. That's a very unusual form of 
construction. Yeah, example. well, it's yeah. a uh, re really. I mean, this uh, this system is mainly used there for internal walls to mm -hmm. alleviate the 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 weight of the structures, uh, spe especially in multi-story uh, buildings. But uh, this was the only um, thing we found out uh, to be, uh, I mean, to match this uh, type of uh, post and beam construction, uh, uh, concrete uh, reinforced concrete structure without having, because normally the, what, what they would do here is uh, fill this, uh, this uh, cavity here, the, the wall with, uh, with uh, concrete block or, mm. or bricks, That's but then you will have all these uh, areas that will uh, generate a, a thermal bridge. So okay. you wouldn't have a continuous insulation anyway. Okay. And that's the reason why we are using this, um, this which is something that they are used to use, uh, use there and, uh, and it's ready, readily available. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel there. Thank you. Okay, so if you leave that slide up for a second there, Enrique, because I think Mackenzie had some similar questions. And while Mackenzie pops on, um, how does the windows get anchored into that foam? Uh, they, uh, they are going to be, uh, for the windows, we have a, a, a wood uh, pocket block yeah. that will uh, hold the windows. Yes, they, they are not going to be anchored onto, onto, the, onto the foam. Very cool. Mackenzie, you with us? Yeah, I'm here. I was going to ask a similar question, um, just kind of second, um, seconding Arnett about that system, just because we don't really see that. Um, I guess kind of a follow up question I was going to ask was the windows. You covered that too. Um, so I guess my next question is, um, are you then framing in the inside for additional insulation? Um, is the EPS your only requirement for insulation in this climate? And yeah, yeah, it the looks EPS, like it's the, also the like the vapor barrier, or that's what you blew in on the inside. I just want to. It's just it's different. So I have a lot of questions. Yeah, no, the that's fine. I mean, the let me show you here one of the this one. Uh, the the EPS uh, is uh, the, uh, I mean it's the all the we, we, what we need in for the thermal uh, boundary. Because uh, the thing is that the, the, the temperature difference there through uh, the year is only seven degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So the thermal uh, con conductivity is not that critical as is the uh, latent heats uh, from the ventilation air or the infiltration air. So for the, the, the plaster itself, I mean, it's uh, applied inside and outside. So you, you'll have basically a a plaster wall, a standard plaster wall, which is something that the people like there because people don't like uh, very much the, the, the gypsum board, the, the uh, drywall, because uh, if, if you knock on a drywall, it, it, uh, it sounds hollow. And people think that uh, it's like a cardboard <laughs> house. So people like to knock on the walls and see that they are solid. And that's one of the reasons why also this, uh, this uh, uh, this technique is, is, is being implemented there. So for uh, critical areas, which are the, uh, the joints of the walls uh, to the floor and to the ceiling, we are using this, uh, 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 this uh, joint, uh, these two components, uh, non-sac water-based uh, sprayable polymer. And uh, that's something that's also being is, uh, used there, uh, very standard for uh, impermeabilization of roofs and or, or decks or things like that. So we're not uh, going away from anything uh, or, or trying to uh, import any uh, uh, materials. We, I mean, the, already the, the ones that uh, the, the Intello uh, Plus that uh, we are using here, it, we had to import uh, uh, because that's not available there. And the, also the Toscana Vena, uh, that's the only part that we are basically using the same um, um, air infiltration or, or uh, yeah, uh, air infiltration abatement uh, techniques that we use here. And uh, your other question was? I think that, I think that covers it. I was also curious about the, are you using the EPS also as your vapor barrier? It's a, yeah, it's a vapor barrier. And uh, because it's uh, it's covered with uh, basically 
I mean, 2.5 uh, centimeters of uh, plaster, cement uh, plaster on the outside, as well as on the inside. So it's a, it's a totally uh, vapor tight uh, um, situation. Yeah, Mackenzie, you could say it's like when you add up all the layers, there's still a, a little allowance for some permeability through the material, but it's right at the point where you're almost a vapor barrier versus a vapor retarder, like you're, you're close enough. But the fact that the one material can take on um, a bunch of different things, it's, it's pretty effective in this situation. So phrases, words, comments before we dive back into the questions? I do, I think um, my reflection, because I've, I had the benefit of seeing this twice now, my reflection is, I think it's absolutely brilliant to use materials that a local area is used to using and also methods that the local workforce is, is using. Putting that together allows your holes to, to be hit there. And I think as we, as we saw that you pivoted to the smaller structures, I think their enhanced beauty and uh, the, the performance factor that they showcase with bringing in the cooling and bringing the de dehumidification will allow for those multifamilies to also come back around. So it's pleasant to always learn about how local materials are done and the effectiveness. It's a learning lesson for all of us. And once we see that, we can find better examples in the projects that we work on to, to, to learn from it. Really appreciate it, Andrew and Enrique. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, really good insight there. So it is the, uh, we're a little bit over the top of the hour. So if you do need to leave, remember, we got one more week before we all maybe put our feet up. Maybe we uh, start doing some planning. We do all good stuff in August. So join us next Wednesday for Passive Accelerator Construction Live, Construction Tech Edition. I'm looking forward to uh, those uh, short, brief, impactful presentations from our community. Um, so if you do need to leave, you can depart. We'll say our good I do's, but otherwise, Enrique and Andrew, they're going to stick around. Uh, I know there's a, definitely a bunch more policy stuff that I want to get into. Um, so next in the queue, next in the queue was uh, Melissa. Melissa, is she still with us? I'm here. Great. Fire away. Um, I guess my comment was um, looking at the EPS with the wire mesh on the outside, thinking that it was to support the stucco. And it reminds me a lot of strategies that are used in straw bale and adobe building, um, where you're building that kind of uh, cage and then ramming the plaster into the cage th so that it really gets kind of keyed in. Um, and one of the things that you have to consider with straw bale and adobe is you're either running conduit for plumbing and electrical, or you're having to cut channels into the wall to accommodate. And so I'm curious how you're handling um, plumbing and electrical. Uh, plumbing and electrical are mainly uh, run uh, in, in the uh, partition walls of, uh, of the houses. So, uh, but uh, I guess uh, we still have uh, couple of uh, pipes that are going to be running on the outside and uh, and that uh, because the, the part I, I mean when I talk about partition walls uh, is the ones uh, between the two um, uh, duplex houses so uh, the but there are a couple of uh, pipes that we are running uh, uh, on the outside and that's a uh, that's a thermal bridge uh, uh, potential that we have there yes we have to address that because that will be covered only mainly by, by the plaster. And are you also um, putting strips of wood in the wall where people could hang pictures or something like that? Um, the, plaster the, sometimes the, is hard to. The, no, the, the walls are very strong. I mean, that's the, the, the standard the construction practice of uh, internal walls. So uh, they, they hold very fine, I mean, nails and pictures and everything, so that uh, it's not really an issue there. 
Thank you. Yeah, Melissa, I have some of these same, similar things of, you know, when you, when you build a, a certain style of wall, you know, with wood and, and gypsum, you kind of have these thoughts of, okay, well, how does it work? And then when you go to something different, you you definitely have these like different questions of, of how does it work? And, you know, you, they may not have the plugs on the right spot of the master bedroom or the master bed where, you know, you want to have it here. You might have it on interior walls and, and maybe a few more extension cords. But, um, you know, again, that's just different differences of some of the building codes and preferences so it may need to see how all this stuff works out and works through but uh um, it looks like enrique and, and andrew do have some some good details coming together it's, it's just interesting um one question i had for you too enrique before we pop into a couple more is um, um having cellulose in the roof being given that it's a bit more of a moist climate is there any um, condensation issues or uh, risks? Like I know you probably ran uh, a bunch of woofy models, sorry, woofy models um, on it. Can you just maybe explain how those, the modeling looked out with that amount of insulation in a moist climate? Or uh, we, yeah, we, we do not expect uh, condensation there. Uh, the cellulose is, um, uh, I mean, that's one of the uh, real uh, issues with the woofy and the cellulose. Actually, I mean, the cellulose is not recommended even here in Vermont uh, for a construction, but, uh, but we are building here in Vermont uh, uh, fully, uh, I mean, totally uh, insulated uh, uh, ho uh, homes with cellulose in the roof, uh, even in flat roofs, uh, flat roofs and, and walls. So um, I, I, I don't expect any uh, condensation there because the, the, the temperature difference is going to be, uh, it's not going to be that, uh, that big, but, um, but yeah, that's, uh, I mean, all this is an experiment. Uh, uh, we, we, we uh, in Argentina, they're using uh, a lot of cellulose, uh, uh, which is manufactured down there, and they are having uh, good experiences with uh, using cellulose in, uh, in humid climates that they have there. So it's uh, something that um, we will be experimenting. Yes, it's, um, but um, we haven't run a, a woofy, uh, 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 I mean, a uh, hydrothermal uh, woofy. We may have to run it um, according to the, to the um, uh, feasibility study that uh, Hughes um, is doing. So uh, that's something that's uh, still in, in consideration there. But uh, the other, the other uh, option was to use, uh, again, uh, EPS uh, on the roof. Uh, and I think this is a much better solution. Yeah. And, and is the cellulose coming from a manufacturer nearby or is that being imported? Cellulose is uh, from here, to, from, uh, from uh, the, uh, what is it called, the um, uh, sanctuary. Yeah, okay. From here, from uh, green, green fiber. Yeah, we, we put everything in a container, 20 foot container, cellulose full with cellulose, the, the minotaurs, the, the uh, door, door test equipment, uh, and the uh, blower door uh, machine, uh, sorry, and the uh, cellulose uh, blowing machine, everything can we ship it down there from awesome. Miami to, to, uh, to Cartagena. Yeah, well, again, too, again, with the Intello, again, it is vapor. Uh, smart vapor open so again you, you'll get inward drying if you need it so at least you're you know the products you're using work well in, in the, the application and again i appreciate how how focused like mark said too about local product local processes and um, even what melissa is saying is like you know we do know about the embodied carbon but sometimes you just need to get these buildings built first and uh, and get them started and then that you can adapt to different materials or different things but um, at least uh, at least you have a process and a system that you can you know populate because a lot of other buildings in in that city or in that location are not doing high performance. So this is a good no. tradition to- Yeah, we, we're trying to use the, uh, I mean, as much as uh, uh, local uh, sources materials as possible. Uh, we were very lucky to find a local source uh, windows, uh, high quality windows. Yeah. Uh, but uh, some other things uh, that uh, were important like, uh, like the Intello, because that's something that uh, we don't want to compromise uh, with. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's worth the, the, the spending the money there. Yeah, and in uh, in the neighborhood, are they, like I think I saw the uh, the concrete drums, are they mixing concrete right beside the pour? Yep. <laughs> oh man. It's, to, it's done in a very, <laughs> in a very uh, rudimentary uh, way. 
I mean, if we once the the whole thing takes off, I mean, they they have uh, pumps there. And okay. Like okay. But for for these four ones, it, it wasn't worth to to bring a whole truck and pumps and everything. Hey, fair enough. Again, some of these test cases, right? They're all about blood, sweat, and tears, and right. And you're definitely working on that, which is great. Again, great great examples. Um, next in the queue, uh, Reed Rollins. You had a couple of questions, Reed. Over to you. Hey guys, uh, great presentation. Nice project. Not small either. Uh, just the previous conversation was geared towards using local materials. And I don't know if you've ever heard of or locally sourced hempcrete. I mean, we are talking uh, Columbia. The Good tempcrete, insulation. Uh, it, the tempcrete is something that has not shown up in Colombia yet. Colombia is uh, one of the largest uh, uh, cement producers in Latin America. So the, it's um, uh, the, the tradition of, uh, of standard cement uh, is, uh, is uh, very, very uh, going back many years. So it's, uh, it's something that, um, that hasn't catch up. Uh, mainly the cement um, uh, producers, uh, what they are doing is using uh, different practices of uh, calcium clay or some things like that to reduce the the carbon content or the carbon footprint. But so far, uh, beside that, those uh, traditional, I mean, uh, uh, processes of uh, uh, introducing <coughs> like, uh, 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 compo I mean, uh, uh, additional components like ply ash or, or, or slag or things like that to reduce the cement content, nothing uh, has been done in terms of uh, of uh, hemp concrete yet, but that's something oh, that I wasn't uh, necessarily we, uh, talking hemp concrete. Uh, it's more in to replace your plaster with hemp plaster, basically. It's lime, water, and hemp, and it might okay. not be happening down there. I don't know, but uh, we uh, the the builder down there hasn't come up with anything like that, so. Maybe that's something that uh, if you if you have some information on that, uh, we still have many houses to build, so that could be a, a good suggestion, probably. Yeah. So Reed, my next question. Yeah, go for it. Actually, I, I, I'm adding one uh, directed to Andrew. Are are you? You know, can I look at my window and see where you are? Are you ten minutes down the road from me, or are you down hi. Columbia? Where are you these days? Yeah, hi, Reed. Good to see you again. Yes, um, I'm I'm here still in Delaware, so we're we're not too far away. No, we're not. Okay, I figured as much. <clears throat> now, Hempcrete. I mean, it's beginning to happen here. The, the farm bill just allowed us to grow hemp. Columbia grows a lot of hemp. Whether or not they're making Hempcrete as a plaster down there. But it also could replace your cellulose in the ceiling. And then we're not worried about moisture at all. If so. you if you have some information about that, I would appreciate that uh, to see what um, what we could explore into that uh, field. I mean, I can send Andrew a couple of links, but it's a matter of finding somebody down there that's doing hempcrete. And it's it's really not rocket science. If they're doing plaster, they could probably do hempcrete if they can find the right hemp herds. Yeah, because I read, I think you are uh, got the wrong location uh, down there for vices. It's not uh, hemp, it's coke, so it'd be cocrete, and I don't think that's been invented yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. That, 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 that may introduce some, uh, some logistics problems. Yes. Hey, but there, it is a fiber. It is a fiber, so you never know. All right, well, my so other what they're they using, they using down there for, uh, to alleviate the concrete for, uh, for the subfloors, and, and it's going to be used here, is a mixture of, uh, of cement, and uh, and EPS uh, pebbles, uh, oh. so that fifty fifty, that's uh, that's something that regular practice there, and that's uh, what we are using here as a sub sub floor, yes. Okay, so my last question was on uh, your solar water heater. Were they vacuum tubes or what kind of collector? Yeah, it's and a, do you have a name? It, yeah, it's a vacuum tube uh, type. Yes. Is it locally or is it imported? I think they are imported uh, from China, but uh, okay. they are uh, readily available there. Yeah. So it's uh, something that's uh, easily uh, uh, accessible. Oh, they're right. great. Vacuums are great. A little delicate. You, you might have some breakage here and there, but uh, order a few extra to replace yeah. the ones during transport and installation. 
Great, great system. Great project. Thanks, guys. Hey, Thank welcome. you. Great for joining us. Always a pleasure. Um, now we're over to uh, Bernard. Let's see Bernard still with us. Hello. Um, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I was just wondering about uh, drainage layer below the stucco. And as you uh, showed more detail of the panels and the way the the stucco or the plaster is applied to the exterior, I'm wondering if the grooves are forming that drainage layer, or maybe in this case, there isn't even a need for one, given your humidity levels. Uh, is that plaster going to always have a certain level of moisture to it? Um, just, just wondering what the what the thinking was there. Um, I know in I'm in Canada here, and obviously we have different regions. And uh, you know, anybody in Vancouver will know that uh, there's quite. Um, a concern about stucco there and having a proper drainage layer. Uh, less so here where I am, where the climate's quite dry. And then I'm also wondering, do you also have overhangs on the roof to keep rain away from the wall? Uh, yes, there are overhangs on the, on the roof. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, not only for, for, uh, for the rain, but also to provide additional shading, which is very important. But uh, uh, the, it, it's a it's a common practice to use the stucco there, uh, and uh, and there don't doesn't seem to be any need for drainage planes. Uh, when you talk about drainage planes, uh, you're talking something like a, 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 a rain screen or something, or or it's just a, basically a rain screen. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they, there is uh, absolutely no uh, no uh, no um, practice of uh, rain screens there. Mm. The, the stucco is uh, directly, I mean, on the uh, on the outside and without and in direct contact with the with the structure or with the uh, uh, with the bricks or whatever you put it on, and it uh, doesn't have any any kind of uh, raining uh, rain screen. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my next question was about the windows, just the the glazing, the high performance glazing, and I should preface uh, my comments by kind of coming clean here and saying that. Uh, uh, my focus is actually on heritage conservation. And, uh, you know, the heritage conservation community is really quite suspicious of contemporary high performance windows, just the short life cycle, the non repairable aspect of them. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the reports that I've dealt with at my work just boggled my mind in terms of the amount of money that's being spent for these windows and then combined with the short life cycle the the depreciation cost is just epic and there's nothing you can do with them at the end of their life cycle other than throw them away so um and then I'm, I'm also wondering about just the window wall relationship um you know in historic buildings we're often dealing with smaller windows right smaller openings and putting in high performance glazing often diminishes the amount of light coming in. So um, I guess I'm not answering, asking for any answers here, but just, just wondering about um, uh, you know, what you're thinking might be around this question and also the whole notion of life cycle of the high performance, uh, you know, highly coded windows and they're also very expensive. They are, and they are basically the most expensive component uh, uh, that we are using there. And uh, yes, uh, the we really are not analyzing the life cycle of the window. Um, I'm not sure if there is some data there about the uh, life cycles at this point of, of these high performing windows, uh, given that we are being having installed them and so, such a, since uh, such a short time, uh, like 10, 15 years or something like that. So uh, definitely, I mean, it's this is an experiment on there because nobody is using double uh, glazed windows uh, with insulated frames uh, and high performance windows there. Uh, the regular, the standard construction is just uh, single pane windows 
with uh, this uh, slight uh, type of uh, uh, mechanism uh, that has absolutely no uh, air tightness, no nothing. And, uh, and, and the, the frame is an aluminum uh, frame without uh, any uh, uh, thermal break or insulation or nothing. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a big um, um, expensive component that we are having uh, to compete with, uh, with uh, standard construction. Because uh, uh, it's still not, um, I mean, uh, the, 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 the people are not used to high performance anything. They're just used to high, put uh, 60,000 BTUs um, uh, air conditioning and, uh, and open the windows to, for, uh, for cooling, for uh, air ventilation. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is creating uh, very cold surfaces. I mean, it, it's wasting a, a ton of energy and also creating uh, in, indoor uh, very cold surfaces where you have uh, right. condensation of the, uh, of the high humidity air and mold formation. So in many places that you uh, uh, go into the Caribbean uh, buildings, you, you smell the, the mold because, because of that the problem, because uh, it's a, a huge, very, very high, uh, I mean, power, uh, air conditioning that are not really doing uh, the job because uh, if you don't have air tightness and you don't have uh, balanced ventilation, the heat recovery, any no no air conditioning will give you the dehumidification that you need. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's incredibly interesting. Um, and and it's a totally different scenario than what we have here. <laughs> Um, no, it's it's very interesting, and and um, you know it's hard to know what the answer is in this one. Um, I think that uh, actually wood windows with removable thermal units or replaceable um, with a linseed oil based paint gives the best kind of balance of life cycle performance, the notion of repairability down the line. So you may end up switching out the, the sealed unit, but you don't necessarily throw away the whole window. Um, and then that I, actually- I, I think in our case, it's an it's a aluminum frame. So the aluminum frame can certainly be a reuse or recycle and, uh, and, and uh, paint uh, the um, double pane uh, Gla and the glazing can be replaced. And uh, the ceiling, yes, that's something that uh, certainly can be could be done. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, of having wood windows, it's 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 uh, very complex to have uh, any anything wood in in these uh, high uh, hot and humid climates because of the uh, of the insects. Yes, and uh, so it's uh, and and also the the I mean. The exposure to the elements uh, is so 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 strong, but so so heavy that it's uh, a wood window. Uh, it's probably going to last much much uh, shorter than uh, than an aluminum. Right, right. And then um, my last question actually follows on that about, and I think you touched on it, but I didn't quite catch it um, about the line of continuity of the air barrier on the inside and how that connects in a positive way to the windows. The windows, uh, we, we're gonna have uh, them also uh, uh, taped with, uh, with the Tuscon Havana tape. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that with the, uh, with the uh, tiny houses that you saw there. Okay. So it's something that uh, uh, we already experimented with. And that's the same way we are gonna be air tightening them. Uh, originally, we thought to, to use the same uh, 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 emulsion that uh, we're using in the in the joints uh, of the walls with the with the um, uh, floors, but uh, uh, the the tape uh, is going to perform much better, and it's going to be uh, much better finishing too. Right. Yeah, okay. really good good insights. Great questions, Bernard. I mean, it's it's uh, you know I think the key thing is one is. There are, there are not too many passive houses in the, in the hot climate climates that we're seeing, especially in this area of the world. And so one, we need to get, and Mark alluded to it as well, is let's use as many common practices that are there because we all know that the biggest issue in price is teaching the trades how to, how to do new things. And so the ability to 
use more common materials and common practices and then add a bit to it. And I think we'd all agree with, you know, that by the time they do that last multifamily project on that property, it might be different compared to the first ones, um, but we need to get them going and let them be leaders in the community, let them be leaders in the country for this particular project. And I, again, someone said it in the, uh, in the comments as well, the scale of this project. It's so amazing that it's not just one house. Like I think right now, one of the first passive houses in Mexico is still like one little 1200 square foot unit, right? And the fact that you already have the, the four tiny houses that are, are in process, you've got the houses and, and hopefully you have more of a steady stream of uh, production in the next five years. And so maybe that's another question too, between Andrew and Ricky is, is before the pandemic, you know, before there was a big stop in the process, what was the plan for production until we had that last kind of commercial unit uh, manufactured here? What was the, what was the, what was the plan for scale? Um, so originally the, the plan was to, to start with the uh, multifamily housing uh, buildings. We had uh, 48 units, uh, three towers uh, as the first sort of uh, draw to start the project. Uh, basically what we, we shifted a little bit for a couple of reasons. Obviously the pandemic, um, it shut us down for a minimum of six months in terms of any kind of work that we could do. Um, we was easy actually just to get a license for the uh, a building license for the houses. So we decided to start kind of the easier way in that way. Uh, we do have a license to build multifamily on a different uh, lot, but we chose also to go with a, a higher end of the market. So the houses are more for the higher end uh, than the uh, multifamily, which are more for the middle class. Um, given the uncertainty of the economics and the uncertainty of the new technology, uh, you know, the, the first adapters are going to be willing to pay a little bit more for the novelty of, you know, whether you want to call it a sustainable home or the green home or the first passive house in Colombia. So it was in a way a, a business decision, a marketing decision, uh, and also obviously the circumstances that changed our plans along the way. Um, I think, you know, the goal is now after we finish this 27 houses to move on to the multifamily and down the road, we're going to do some commercial as well. So uh, we, we definitely look forward to being able to, to, to try all this out in different building types uh, from the tiny homes to commercial and see, you know, how much we can take uh, in terms of our learning with you guys. Yeah, well, and again, the, uh, if we look at Tesla, the Tesla model worked. You start with the Tesla Roadster, then you bring out the X and the, uh, the, the, uh, the three and, and then the Y. So keep working on it. That's just great. Um, Where's your Tesla coming, Sean? You ordered one. Oh, well, Cybertruck. Hey, the factory is starting. You know, hey, if these guys got their first thing, we got the other one going too. It's, it's great. So we're working on it. And I, actually, you know what? I might even be getting the, the Y first because I think I convinced the missus to upgrade her gas guzzling bmw to one so uh we might have a, a few electric cars in the family everyone let's road trip to bc and jump out of sean's car and do a carnival clown commercial for pass fast accelerator It'd be perfect okay. stuff you in it and there we go all right over to uh Chirana, to ph malnair peter where are you i know you're still yeah, here I'm you right, always hang around right here. Yes, there, you go. Good. there you go the question to enrique and uh probably the structural, um, how much seismic activity is there in your area where you're building? And did you have to include that consideration in components for the house? There is a great deal of uh, seismic uh, activity in Colombia, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the post and beam uh, structure is done. Actually, for the, for the um, uh, multifamily, we had considered uh, this um, um, uh, a system of, of casting the walls, which is uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, forms that are very uh, reproducible, but uh, that system requires a, a, a solid um, uh, base, uh, I mean, uh, a, a solid concrete platform. And since the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, parking lots were going to be down, I mean, the structural engineer turned that uh, down because he said, no, we have to go all the way down with the uh, structural uh, uh, beams all the way down to the ground and have a good footing 
we cannot have any kind of uh, of uh, partitions of any way because of the seismic uh, conditions there. So it's a, it, that's one of the reasons why this uh, type of, you see how they uh, are so well strapped. I mean, uh, uh, the, the structural. Uh, so it's uh, one of the reasons why they are built that way because of the seismic, uh, high seismic condition. Although in Cartagena it's less than in the, in the Andes uh, region, but uh, still you have uh, the same uh, code uh, uh, restrictions there. Because of the soil condition, basically that the, the house is actually floating. So that's, uh, that's it's, it's not for the uh, seismic aspects, uh, which is very um, uh, high in Bogota, which is in the mountains, but in Cartagena, you won't have that issue at all. But still the houses are floating. And Peter, they got the Tesco and Vanna. If there's cracks in the wall, they're just going to stretch a little tape over that, patch it up, do the little swipe with the card, and it'll keep it airtight, so you don't have to worry about that. And also the that uh, uh, um, rubbery emulsion that also stretches yeah. very nice. <laughs> and That's are you guys using that from Pro Climber as well? Or are you guys using that? I think you said you're using a local product to do that. There is a there is a local supplier there yet. Uh, I think it's a, a, a company originally or a product originally from Israel. Yeah. But uh, but uh, it, they are well established down there in Colombia and uh, they have supply in Colombia. So we don't want to try to, I mean, we want to avoid to import uh, as many materials as possible. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and there was one last comment about uh, termites in the cellulose, but Mr. R. Arnett did some research and is not worried about termites anymore. So it looks like your system's foolproof, looking pretty good. Uh, well, that kind of wraps up all the questions. Um, Andrew, again, maybe we'll just talk about policy because I feel like uh, um, you kind of jumped off and jumped back on and, and there's, you know, the policy aspect is really interesting because um, this is a new project. This is a new type of, of product to the market in Colombia. And, and when you first pitch it to the local communities or authorities, um, how was that viewed? And, and can you just talk about how um, how you guys force this upon the community, or did you just say, "Hey, we're building something," and by the way, it's passive house. Like, how did you how did you get this to work? Yeah, well, we, we're lucky enough that we 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 got to choose the way to build it. So that that's one of the things we we didn't really have to convince anybody. Um, the builder that we work with, who is a partner in the company, uh, really was embracing the idea. Um, even though he's not a passive house certified, he really was very much uh, into uh, trying to figure out a way to make this happen under the local conditions. And, and as you see, I mean, we're trying to implement as much as possible with, with uh, local uh, building um, methodology. And also the reason that we do that is because we foresee that in the future, uh, it's going to be hard to sell unless we sell the same kind of walls. People are going to go and touch the ball and knock the wall. And if they hear drywall, they're going to walk away. People in, in Cartagena, they don't like drywalls. They don't like empty, hollow walls. So we want to have the feel and the touch and the look as a standard construction just, you know, under the passive house. There was, there was, a, there was a good, uh, I mean, uh, um, learning curve for the builders and the developers and everything that we had to do. Because when, when, when the project started, nobody had a clue about the passive house. So we had, we had to, to give them a lot of um, instructions, a lot of lessons, a lot of meetings uh, to bring them up to speed of what uh, the process is, what the thermal bridges are, what the uh, insulation is, what the, uh, the ventilation is, uh, all the things uh, that are not used there because uh, nobody is having a, a heat recovery ventilation system or having a, a insulation on the walls, uh, nothing like that. So it's a, it was a, it was a good um, learning uh, period that we had to to do with the with the whole team. So of course, you know, our good friend Kevin Brandon wants to ask this question: Was there a mock-up done before you started building? No, we didn't. The, the, the mock-ups are th those that you're seeing. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hey, they, they're looking good. And I mean, again, the uh, um, and even coming back to a previous question about the windows, uh, Bernard asked a good question. And, and I think 
what I found in passless projects is when a window size is chosen, there's a lot more, you know, if you do like if you look at the Cornell Tech where they had a lot less glazing in the windows, but the lighting that provided, they were at the right height, they were the right size, you know, the, the manufacturer kind of commented about what is the best size to manufacture. And so there's a lot of really good communication in in the process of, of where and how the windows should be developed. And I'm just wondering with, with, you know, you chose to like eliminate a window because of, you know, potential issues. So may, can you just maybe explain um, some of your decisions and discussions around the window sizes and how they were determined? Because I think there's some really good insights in that, in that decision-making. The windows house, uh, the window sizes uh, were basically determined uh, to uh, uh, get the, the lowest um, uh, window to, to surface or to wall area uh, ratio possible uh, without uh, compromising too much the, the light. Uh, but uh, yeah, that uh, was mainly the, the, the concern. But uh, the, the, the design was uh, basically made uh, according to uh, standard uh, uh, practices there of, uh, of window uh, uh, distribution and window sizes and all that. So I, I just may have uh, 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 eliminated the one window, for example, of the, uh, of the uh, second floor room uh, that had two windows, uh, one exposed to the west, and that uh, may, makes a big difference. Uh, but uh, but in general, uh, I mean, the, the, the window, this, I, I didn't change much uh, uh, of, of the windows uh, from what the architect actually designed in there. Cool. Well, and again, I think you're getting a lot of praise of, of keeping this local and keeping the design local and making sure that it's not too different than the norm, except that it might have thicker walls and, you know, might not have mold in, in six months after they move in, which is great. Um, I, the shading part, I'm always intrigued on because I know Bronwyn Berry, when she presented a few months ago, talked about uh, the overhang of the roof and that the overhang, I mean, North America, we think of the roof as, as, as shedding water, but for you, it's stopping sunlight getting in. And um, can you again, just talk about um, the formulation of the roof design? Because, um, I mean... When we talk about our passless principles, I would always say, you know, high performance windows and then in brackets, exterior shading. And in this case, your exterior shading is part of the roof design. And, um, and the fact that the model helped prove the shading size of the roof size to help out on the impact, I think it's really insightful. So can you maybe just talk about the model and how it, it helped out with creating the shading? The, yeah, the, 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 the eaves sort of, um, extension of the roof uh, has to be done I mean in in a way that it really uh, I mean doesn't increase too much the, the cost because you, we are already uh, taking uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, extra cost with the, all this ventilation equipment with the uh, dehumidification equipment uh, and all those things uh, that uh, so in order to we, we cannot go overboard with that otherwise the the, the, the market uh, is, is not going to take it. They, they, we still have to be within the market range. The, the overhangs uh, really, uh, I mean, provide some, uh, some uh, shading to the upper windows, the second floor windows. But the problem, the problem here is mainly the west uh, sun. And, uh, and the west sun uh, is very, very hard to, to, um, uh, to shade. Because uh, I mean, unless you have like a, like an exterior uh, blind uh, that you uh, mechanically uh, or manually uh, pull down or up, there is no much uh, that you can do with uh, with the west uh, exposure. So that that is one of the problems of, of the houses, the 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 the, build, the, the multifamily buildings. Uh, we uh, came uh, uh, early enough. Uh, into the ur urban uh, decision, and they they are uh, oriented uh, properly to the south, not for the same reason that uh, we orient them uh, to the south uh, here uh, in in uh, in the northern hem hemisphere, but to avoid uh, I mean the largest uh, surfaces to the west where we have the main uh, uh, solar gain. So as you can see, the the the, the, the 
narrow shape of the of the building is to the west to avoid that um, that and uh, and uh, for the for the um, for the multifamily we're putting a, a like a, a shading element on top of uh, of the window sill on every single window in this case uh, we're just using uh, i mean in, in the lower um, uh, windows uh, the lower uh, the first floor because door the the, the, the this uh, dining room uh, and living room uh, windows are the the biggest one and they are exposed to the to the um, to the west so uh, we basically have only one window to the west that is uh, in uh, on the second floor and the rest uh, do not have uh, i mean can be shaded uh, uh, partially from the from the overhangs of, of the roof, and uh, but it cannot be. I mean, I I, I said uh, to the architect, uh, I mean we should have a lar larger overhangs, and he said, well, we can put uh, any any size overhang there, but yeah. how much is it going to cost? <laughs> well, I think what's interesting here is again, if somebody can come up with maybe a one percent extra on the overall cost exterior shading device and make sure that it's in Miami the next time you're shipping a container down to your projects you might have a win folks so either you're importing them from somewhere around the world but make sure they're on the dock in Miami the next time this uh, boat sails to uh, to this project so yeah maybe round two all right great stuff uh Derek you had a question Derek over to you bud mm, yeah thank you Enrique and Andrew for the presentation uh actually visited uh Colombia a long time ago when I first started the Mincash so um it's a beautiful place uh, but I think you may have actually answered my question when you were talking about the price uh, point. The question is about um, because you have a good ceiling, or excuse me, roof size to floors, uh, have you considered um, net zero solar uh, or any solar, at least in the multi dwelling units, to um, have you know some consistency for uh, uh, power? Yes, uh, we we are considering that, and that's part of the PU's um, uh, feasibility study. Uh, actually, in the in the three um, um, uh, scenarios uh, that we did for the with PU's in 2019 for the multifamily homes, we we did uh, 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 thorough analysis of uh, PVs. Uh, the roof uh, uh, top uh, area doesn't. Uh, is not large enough uh, to cover the whole need for the 48 apartments, but uh, mm -hmm. covers uh, uh, like half of it. And the rest uh, will have to be, I mean, uh, uh, like uh, municipal or, or, uh, or, uh, or somewhere else. But uh, yes, those, uh, those, have, uh, those are uh, considering, those are being considered um, at this point. Mm -hmm. The, the, the everything uh, I mean the, the problem is uh, to make them uh, marketable because uh, we're competing with uh, with a very cheap um, type of product and uh, and so we can we have to limit our, our resources to the very basic that will provide uh, I mean a good comfortable uh, interior and healthy and uh, and low uh, energy consumption and then we we can add uh, all these um, other uh, elements. So. Yeah, we're, we're mm -hmm. How's, the, how's the power there? Oh, sorry. So, no, no, go ahead. It's basically, we, we're definitely looking at PV in other ways. I mean, for for um, the road um, for the road lighting, it's an all independent PV uh, supply. And also for some of the car uh, parking areas, which will have roofs, instead of having a roof, we'll have a PV roof instead for, for the car parking. So we're definitely looking at trying to maximize uh, the floor area that um, we can for the PV. Um, so that that's something that's kind of in the works is still you know being developed, but definitely it's one of the key uh, components to get the energy in this building. So we definitely want to produce as much energy as possible on site. Uh, to mm -hmm. answer the question, oh. in terms of the energy, it's it's uh, you know on and off. Quality of uh, supply is not guaranteed 100% of the time. Uh, energy is expensive there, 19 kilowatt, 19 cents kilowatt hour, and uh, going up. So it's uh, it's a quite an expensive uh, electricity supply. In in Colombia, the, the 
So in Colombia, in Colombia, electricity is generated uh, about 60% by hydroelectric. So in that respect, it's a real clean uh, net, uh, uh, net. But uh, in, at the Atlantic coast, there is there are a lot of uh, um, um, fossil fuel generated uh, electricity with the with gas. So. Uh, that's uh, that's why it's probably one of the reasons why it's uh, so expensive there, and it's where the, the mm -hmm. most consumption is. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk with you guys about the new products. Uh, I think we may introduce it here on Passive House also, um, but it's specifically to solve that problem. It's like we just cover lights, uh, lumen cash, light storage. And um, and great for that kind of environment. That's why I was there so many years ago. Um, and we're finally making the product that's at a very very low price. So it could it could uh, make everybody's file there because it'll fit into the market just fine. Well, uh, we'll, we'll we will be happy to look into that. Uh, uh, send us the information and uh, and yes, the the, the part of the uh, I mean the. Uh, lightning has not been decided yet. Uh, we're going to go with uh, LEDs uh, lights, but uh, if you have something better to consider, I mean, there are a lot of uh, products coming from China to Colombia, so it's uh, it wouldn't be any problem. Hey, again, you got another container from Miami, you got another container leaving uh, some port on the Chinese border. Yeah. <laughs> Here, keep it connected, load them up with the, uh, you know, the hot water PV stuff, put your lights in there too and ship it come on let's make let's make a deal folks i feel like we just turned into a game show here <laughs> who can make a deal who can make this project better here we go good stuff um tom phillips you're next in the queue over to you hey great stuff um just uh the usual question about overheating under future climates um i've seen some recent studies from brazil and maybe some other hot and humid places where they're uh, you know, modeling that, and I um, was wondering if you were able to look at it for this project in Cartagena. And the second question is about wind-driven rain. Is that a problem down there for hurricane season or whatever? Uh, we are not uh, affected by hurricanes as much as the Caribbean islands and uh, Central America, because um, most of the hurricanes just uh, uh, go along the, the coast and we may get some rain, yes. Yes, there is some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, rain, uh, horizontal rain there. But uh, yeah, that's uh, something that's being considered there in, in the uh, building practice, yes. So hurricanes are not, uh, not, uh, not a problem there. We, we deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, earthquakes, not hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then in terms of uh, future climate, uh, the tropics are going to heat up, uh, you know, a fair amount, of course, not as much on a relative basis as the northern, uh, the, the, the higher latitudes, the lower latitudes, but it's still, I think, going to be significant, um, you know, in the life cycle of these buildings. Um, and I, I think, I've, like I said, I think a Brazilian study looked at that. The one other question. Uh, question um, came to mind is about uh, predominant breezes there and were you able to orient for those? You mean uh, um, wind for natural ventilation? The, the problem with natural ventilation is that you're ventilating with uh, uh, 76 Fahrenheit uh, or 24.5 uh, uh, <laughs> degrees uh, dew, dew points. Yeah. So it's um, it's a counterintuitive. Either you have, uh, yeah, the, the, the original ones, uh, I mean, the original buildings were, were built that way. Uh, the, the, the colonial construction was built with a, with a central uh, plaza and windows uh, all over. So you had the cross ventilation and, uh, and nice shading. But now the, all those old buildings are turning into, uh, uh, are, are installing air conditioning uh, systems because uh, that's what people want to have. And, uh, and, 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 and they are in, being installed in, in buildings that uh, have absolutely no insulation, no air tightness, no nothing. So it's, uh, uh, you, they, they are not delivering the, the, 
the what the the result that you are expecting. The the main the main problem if you if you go back to the to the uh, Wolfe uh, report, you'll see that the latent heat uh, I mean is almost twice the the sensible. So the main problem is uh, humidity. If you can reduce the humidity, I mean you can even uh, operate at a higher temperature. The uh, the uh, Side temperature of pacifiers is uh, 68 uh, Fahrenheit of 20 centigrade, but uh, but uh, we consider that uh, uh, um, that's what I mentioned with the adaptive uh, mode. You can raise uh, like 22 uh, centigrade or or 72 Fahrenheit, and you can still feel okay uh, with uh, because the the the, the uh, humidity is reduced. So as long as you reduce the humidity you feel much better even at higher temperature. So that's, uh, that's one of the strategies that uh, we're trying to implement. And because, uh, I mean, people in the tropics are used to higher temperatures. One of the things I suffered when I was living in Miami or that living, uh, going into a building with air conditioning because, I mean, you freeze. In Venezuela, the same thing. I mean, we had an office in Venezuela and uh, I, I, when I went, went to visit them, we had a meeting Every two hours, I had to go to the parking lot to mm -hmm. warm up because I was totally frozen. I mean, because they has they have a sixty thousand BTUs. I mean, mini split there in 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 a in, in a office. Okay, blowing. The, everybody comes with the winter jackets and everything <laughs> because they cannot they cannot stand the cold. And I came. I mean, from here in in my t-shirt. I mean. Cotton T-shirt, <laughs> so I had to go every two hours out to the parking lot to to warm up, <laughs> and that's the, that's the way they do it. I mean, so it's a waste, a tremendous waste of energy. Uh, really, really insightful stuff. Well, I think we have pushed things to the limit here. We should say goodnight to everybody. Uh, I know Ratko is still enjoying his morning coffee over in Australia. Uh, I was going to give props to uh, Suzanne, who is like 3 a.m. in Germany. So, I mean, we're, it's great to see everyone from across the globe join us. So I appreciate it all. But Andrew and Enrique, we wish you guys the best with this project. Come back once the, uh, the other ones, you know, the latest ones are sold and the clients are happy and you've got further insight about either uh, other innovations and uh, uh, product adoptions you were trying to do with this project. But uh, bravo, you know, and, and then, you know, again, Enrique, you give us prop all the time for, you know, the accelerator for being here together. It's people like you that have been here every week for two solid years and you show up early and we get to hear your insights. Um, we appreciate you as much as you appreciate us. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, thank everybody. You everybody. And, and hey, be back here next Wednesday. Mark, anything else you got to say? All right, he's out of here. We're out of here. Kim, cut us off.